Sega is a brand that's overwhelmingly associated with their two most successful entities. The first being that little blue hedgehog known as Sonic, the second is their most successful console of all time, the Mega Drive, or Genesis if you're in North America. But we all know Sega were and continues to be responsible for much more than that. Some good, some bad. One console which I firmly place in the good and hugely underrated camp is the Sega Master System. Known well in the UK, Europe and Brazil, but far rarer in other regions. A technologically sound console marred by timing, marketing decisions and rivalry. So let's begin at the beginning. In the beginning, God created... But possibly not that far back. It's 1940, and Standard Games have just been founded by American businessmen Martin Bromley, Irving Bromberg and James Humpert. The trio's original premise was to provide coin-operated amusement machines to American military bases, swollen and expanding from the outset of World War II. And as we know, war is good for business, especially those who capitalise on it. The premise proved successful, providing entertainment to servicemen and women looking to pass the time. After the war, the company was renamed to Service Games, reflecting their military market, and began to focus on the now occupied shores of Japan. This was pushed harder when in 1951, the US government began the outlaw of gambling slot machines. Service Games began importing these now homeless machines from the states and relocated their base to Tokyo, becoming Service Games of Japan. With the new supply of machines, the company shifted their focus from equipping US military bases to the gaze of the Japanese public, expanding their warehouse production facilities and merging in 1965 with a company founded by American Air Force officer David Rosen. Rosen had also found opportunity on Japanese shores, and was importing coin-operated games for the Japanese public. Rosen Enterprises and Service Games would jointly become Sega Enterprises, an amalgamation of Service Games and Rosen Enterprises, and within a year the company would launch the innovative Periscope, both for the West and Eastern regions, becoming the first US arcade game to cost 25 cents per play. In 1969, Sega was sold to Gulf and Western Industries, with Rosen remaining as CEO. The company prospered in the 70s and early 80s from the arcade boom, both in America and Japan. Revenues increased to over $100 million by 1979, and by 1982 they were over $200 million. This year would also see the release of Zaxxon, Subrock 3D, and Pengo. But Sega had their eye on the home market, and weren't blind to the success of Atari's 2600, nor the swathe of other machines landing in front of televisions across the globe. This eye would soon turn to a full stare given the decline of the arcade industry around this era, and subsequently the North American arcade division and licensing rights were sold to Bally Manufacturing in 1983. The North American R&D division and Sega Enterprises of Japan were, however, retained. During this time, Sega Enterprises had been secretly testing a home console, and it was now the right moment to bring it to market, especially in the face of rival Nintendo's speedy development of their own machine. As fate and eagerness to be the first to market would have it, both the Nintendo Family Computer and Sega SG-1000 would be released on July 15th, 1983. Initially, the SG was exclusive to Japan, but was later exported to New Zealand and distributed by Grandstand. Both machines launched for about 15,000 yen, which is roughly $120, with Sega also launching a computer version, the SC-3000, with more memory and marketed in several countries. Nintendo's Famicom experienced initial technical difficulties, resulting in a replacement service, but the SG-1000 was to all intents and purposes a ColecoVision with just slightly faster RAM, and couldn't keep up with Nintendo's hardware. The Famicom had horizontal scrolling, sprites, and a reasonable colour palette, and would wipe out most competitor consoles in Japan, including offerings by Tomy and Bandai, with only the SG-1000 struggling through on its Sega-exclusive hardware conversions, such as Monaco Grand Prix and Sega Gallagher. In 1984, Sega would be bought out by Japanese holding company CSK, with Hayu Nakayama becoming president and CEO. 
Its business registration was also relocated from America to Japan. This year Sega would also try and improve some of the SG-1000's shortcomings by adding detachable remodeled controllers, much more akin to the Famicom's Game & Watch based pads, and the ability to play lower cost card games. The console itself was given a makeover and on July the 31st 1984 released as Sega's SG-1000 II. Accessories such as a keyboard and steering wheel were also introduced to bolster sales, and although it sold, it didn't sell well enough to dent the Famicom's success. Rather than throwing in the towel, Sega knew they now had a production process and infrastructure to build on, and saw the increasingly tall glass as half full rather than shattered and leaking. A plan was hatched to create a system with better specifications than the Famicom and beat Nintendo at their own game. This system would retain backwards compatibility, but drop the SG tag and simply be known as the Sega Mark III. Released in October 1985, it sported a Zilog Z80 CPU running at 3.5MHz, a TMS9918 derived graphics processor offering up to 64 on-screen sprites and multi-directional scrolling. A palette of 64 colours with 32 on screen, or the full 64 with some clever coding. Screen resolutions of up to 256 by 224 pixels, a Texas SN76489 PSG capable sound chip with four channels. FM sound, similar to that of the Mega Drive, was also available through an expansion cartridge. 8 kilobytes of RAM and 16 kilobytes of video RAM, capacity for four megabit cartridges or the cheaper 256 kilobit game cards. The hardware is housed in a large solid case, very similar to the SG-1000 II in look. It also has two 9-pin controller ports, an AV and RF out, power button, expansion slot, pause and reset buttons and even storage for those pads. This really did beat the Famicom in almost every category, but yet was priced at the same price as their previous consoles and the Famicom. The only problem was the head start Nintendo had gained while Sega were fumbling. The Famicom had now asserted itself as the most popular control unit in Japan, and was already offloading on US shores as the remodeled NES. Sega had a big hill to climb and not much time to do it. To make matters worse, Nintendo had begun making strict licensing agreements with publishers, preventing them from publishing games on rival hardware. The only Western publishers who would stick with Sega were Activision and Parker Brothers. This meant that Sega had to rely on their own games and deals to reprogram titles from third parties so they could be sold under the Sega brand. The Nintendo Entertainment System Deluxe Set. Batteries not included, Super Mario Brothers and other games sold separately. This essentially meant third parties could develop the games and Sega would buy them from the developer, making a few changes to the programming before release. However, these agreements and the demands from Sega meant that some releases were rushed through development, and early titles witnessed some quality degradation compared to Nintendo games. While Sega worked on producing games for the Mark III, the American R&D team were busy reskinning the console for the American market, just as Nintendo had done. Their product would be called the Sega Master System, to tie in with an idea of releasing a budget base system and also for its connotations to martial arts, with there only being one true master. <laughs> to further tie in with this feeling of strength, the console itself would be known as the Power Base, a direct retaliation to Nintendo insisting the NES console was referred to as the Control Deck. The system would conform to roughly the same dimensions as the Mark III, although styled in black and with a more pronounced midsection. The changes also meant cartridges from the SG-1000 or Mark III wouldn't fit, which was a shame given the Master System was essentially region free across its western releases, but still it meant easier region porting in the future. The pads were also restyled, removing the screw-in knobbly joystick holes, instead opting for a squidgy D-pad and retaining the simple two-button design. Mmm, those pads are so nostalgic. Launching in September 1986 for $200, the base system came with Sega's arcade conversion Hang-On and Safari Hunt, with other variations soon available, including the bundled light gun and 3D glasses, 
But despite these add-ons and a large marketing campaign, the release was still some 11 months later than Nintendo's entertainment system. Despite the optimism, only 125,000 systems were sold by the end of the year. This figure seemed okay when compared to the Atari 7800's 100,000 consoles, but stacked up against the NES, it was almost 1 million machines less. That hill had quickly turned into a mountain. Sega took action to tip the balance, including the appearance of Alex Kidd as a loose mascot. Recognising that Nintendo's Mario Pack-In title was quickly gaining a huge fan base. But even though Alex Kidd in Miracle World was a great and original game, it wasn't a pack-in title and therefore didn't grab the attention-building focus Mario did as an out-of-the-box mascot. By the end of 1987, Nintendo would hold a whopping 83% of the North American video game market. It would seem despite some great games and Sega's reasonable claim that the Master System is the only console where graphics on the box are actually matched by the graphics in the game, it was just too late to make an impact. Sega sold distribution rights to Tonka Toys, who funneled $30 million into marketing the system and helped keep the Master System afloat, but also brought in some further strange marketing tactics, including the refusal to distribute some key titles from other regions, such as the amazing Psycho Fox. Despite having already released the Mark III in Japan, Sega tried the Japanese market one more time, adding FM sound as standard and shipping out a Japanese Master System in October 1987 for about $115, identifiable by the emission of power base on the unit. But nothing could seemingly penetrate the hull of Nintendo's gaming warship on either battlefront. Sega Master System Sega! Although a variant of the system was introduced called the Game Box 9, allowing coin-operated play and designed for installation in hotels, although this was quite a niche audience. But thankfully all was not lost. Sega Enterprises noticed something Nintendo had been neglecting. Although the NES had launched in Europe gradually between 1986 and 1987, the public just hadn't bitten. In the UK, home computers like the Spectrum were firmly hooked into television RF sockets, and like the MSX, an overpriced Japanese machine just wasn't very appealing to us. But this wasn't just a case of national pride. First, we were much more focused on cutting-edge machines such as the Amiga and Atari ST, which made the NES look like vintage technology. This wouldn't have been a problem itself if you appealed to the right customer, but that's the second point. Nintendo had hugely neglected their marketing campaign in the European region, leaving it in the hands of Mattel, who seemingly did their utmost to sweep it under the carpet. Not only did they neglect to stock NESs in main high street chains such as W8 Smiths, but they did nothing to abate the high price tags of the hardware and associated software. You could pick up a second-hand Spectrum for about 20 quid and games for 99 pence, whilst NES titles cost somewhere around the £50 mark. After years of budget computing, the UK just wasn't ready for this. Come late 1987, Sega would give the territory a bash, this time on more even ground. Released only a couple of months after the NES and UK shores, having learnt from previous mistakes, Sega's tactic in this region was a little different. It wasn't going to fail again. Handing distribution rights to Master Games in France and Master Tronic, who were well versed in the UK gaming scene with their Spectrum background, they undercut the NES by about 40 to 60 pounds, with a sub 100 pounds price point and cheaper games. The advertising was also aimed purely at being an arcade in the home, capitalising on instant load times and the fantastic looking Sega arcade conversions. Compared to some of US Gold's attempts on the Spectrum, these games looked incredible and the Master System's tile map backgrounds and parallax simulated line scrolling allowed smoother animation than even some 16-bit machines. The Master System also had 32 hardware sprites of 16 colours, compared to even the Amiga's 8 sprites of 4 colours. The advertising showcased these abilities and garnered the interest of the gaming press, leading to high retail orders from the go. So high in fact that despite every attempt, Sega were unable to deliver stock until Boxing Day. If Nintendo had been on their game, this could easily have seen the end of the Master System as many retailers cancelled their orders, leading to Master Tronic and Master Games facing a 360 degree spin into financial turmoil. 
However, Virgin, keen to grab a piece of a Sega Pi, bought out Mastertronic and later in 1988 took over all European distribution. This restored confidence as advertising continued to focus on the arcade capabilities of the machine. With a niche established and consoles stocked in shops in time for January 1988, systems started selling, and many families were introduced to the wonders of instantaneous loading, something of a marvel in a country rooted firmly in tape-loaded software. Eager not to miss an opportunity, many of the European software houses already familiar with Z80 programming on the Spectrum began looking at the system. These included companies Nintendo hadn't tied into licensing agreements, including Acclaim Entertainment, the evocative US Gold and Domark, leading to a gradual but solid increase in available titles. Whereas the US release witnessed nail upon nail into Sega's coffin, the opposite seemed true here. This was a strange position for European console owners. Usually we'd miss titles that would see a Japanese or North American release, but for Master System owners the tables were turned and a continuous trickle of impressive games and accessories were released on Sega's 8-bit hardware. In total, North America would see about 114 games released, compared to a whopping 269 in Europe, with most of these more varied and original than the US library. Although the US did get its own exclusives, such as ALF. Widely regarded as the worst Master System game of all time. The console bundles themselves also witnessed a shakeup in this time. Alongside the Light Gun Plus Pack and 3D Specs Super Pack, which would have 13 and 8 compatible games respectively, pack in game bundles would change, with Sega finally understanding the power of a bundled mascot. Alex Kidd would begin shipping with systems, leading to many children in Europe and indeed other regions such as Australia, where the system was gathering momentum, holding as much nostalgia for the little monkey boy sprite as that Italian plumber bloke. It's me, Mario! Box art also got a little better, shaking the chains of that simple checkered affair which led to some horrific western recreations in favour of some more colourful variations. Original European bundles included Hang On in the card format, and most original consoles also had a game called Snail Maze built in, accessible by holding up and buttons 1 and 2 whilst powering on. This was a very simple game, but would pave the way for a tradition continued with Sega's next strategy. Sega would release the Mega Drive in Japan in 1988, followed by the Genesis in 89 and the European Mega Drive in 1990. And with this, the Master System 2 was also launched in most regions by Japan, where the system had been discontinued in 89. This iteration was repositioned at a younger audience, evident from the clear genre labelling of game boxes, and designed to soak up the budget market. In doing so, a number of cost-saving measures were made. The internal design was condensed, the card reader was abandoned, meaning card games and 3D glasses were incompatible, and this also led to a classics line being brought out on the cartridge format. The AV out was removed, leaving only an RF connector, as was the expansion port, which Sega had neglected to make any peripherals for. The reset button was also removed, along with the power LED, the vague operation instructions, and even the power on BIOS screen instead incorporating Alex Kidd in Miracle World directly into ROM. Armed with a solid mascot and reduced price, the Master System 2 practically cleaned up the budget console market, whilst its Mega Drive brother soaked up the high-end market. Marketed by the aptly named AussieSoft, Australia were one of the biggest takers of the new model. The Sega Master System 2 with 12 cans of Coke and a Sega baseball can, all for just $159.95. Expanding Sega's profits and strength considerably. Will the two companies always be competing? I hope so. I think it's good. If they compete, then we gain because they compete, they come up with new ideas, each one's trying to outdo the other all the time. Sega's usual trick of incorporating backwards compatibility with their new hardware also saw the release of the Powerbase Converter in 1990, allowing Mega Drive owners to play in Master System titles on the new 16-bit hardware and providing a further outlet for 8-bit software or fans wishing to upgrade. A revised edition was later released in Europe for the Mega Drive 2. 
These were Sega's golden years. The Game Gear, essentially a portable master system, arrived in the US and Europe in 1991 performing reasonably well in North American, domestic and European markets, and actually strengthening the Master System library, given that converting a Game Gear game to the Master System was incredibly straightforward. The Master Gear converter even allowed Master System games to plug directly into the Game Gear hardware. Sega also made a number of significant deals, including tie-ins with Disney and the French publisher of comic book Asterix. This would see a wave of quality 8-bit titles, including Castle of Illusion, the European-only Lucky Dime Caper, and three Asterix games. The June 1991 release of Sonic the Hedgehog for the Mega Drive was quickly followed by his debut on both the Master System and Game Gear. A slower game with more diverse level design, many actually preferred the 8-bit incarnation over its speed-laden counterpart. The Hogs adoption as the Sega mascot quickly meant Mark II Master Systems became available with the Blue Hedgehog as the new built-in game. And this wouldn't be the only Mega Drive game to make it into 8 bits. A slew of conversions trickled out throughout the 90s, keeping budget gamers relatively content whilst drooling over 16-bit graphics on Games Master and every magazine available. A brief period of respite occurred in 1993 with an entire magazine, Sega Master Force, dedicated to the console. Sadly, it would only last six issues before biting the bullet, but coverage of the console continued here and there, as did a steady release of games. Sure, we didn't see many blockbusters towards the mid-90s, but releases such as the fantastic Robocop vs Terminator kept the die-hard fans happy enough, including myself, until we could afford a second-hand Mega Drive, that is. Some conversions make such good use of the 8-bit hardware, it's difficult to tell the difference between them and their Mega Drive counterparts. These games were really where the Master System shines compared to the NES, and what made the system so endearing to its fanbase. Thing which had been lacking up until the arrival of Sonic was exciting characters, and in 1990 the NES actually outsold the UK Master System for the first time, when the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles bundle arrived. However, given the game's rather turgid gameplay and Sega kicking things up a gear, this was a short-lived balance tip. Sega abandoned the Master System in North America in 1992, with Sonic being the final North American release the very same game which reignited excitement in Europe. This was funnily enough the same year I first got my own Master System, and with an active user base of over 6 million by 1993 throughout Europe, larger than the Mega Drive at the time, the system continued to sell right up until the mid-90s in successful markets. The same was true in Australia, with the system not abandoned until 1996 in lieu of the Sega Saturn's release and the Mega Drive taking up the new budget spot. The final official recorded Western Master System game would be the incredibly rare The Smurfs Travel the World. And talking about the world, worldwide sales for the Master System were approximately 13 million, a small fraction of the entertainment system's 60 million, but broken down we see that although the Master System sold just 1.5 million in North America, some 10 million were sold in other regions, excluding Japan. And this actually tops the 8.5 million NES systems sold to the same regions, with many of those sales actually coming from Asian countries. So although Nintendo dominated the main Japanese and North American markets, Sega's 8-bit hardware just about pipped the post everywhere else. Spurred on, and having learnt the lesson of getting to the market early, the rivalry would be further closed by the Mega Drive's 40 million sales to 49 million of the SNES. But that's a story for another day. But this isn't the end of the Master System story. One thing that's excluded from any of these figures is the market of Brazil. Not a dominant market in the world stage, but where the Master System is concerned, it's quite a big one. Released in Brazil in 1989, the Master System was quickly handed over to local toy manufacturer Tech Toy for distribution. Tech Toy released a number of bundles and actually labelled the release of the Alex Kid bundle as the Master System 2. 
This meant that when the actual MS2 hardware was released, the Brazilian version was marketed as the Master System 3 Compact. Various other releases were created, including the Master System Girl and Master System Super Compact, allowing wireless RF transmission. Total Master System sales before the century was out would sit approximately at 6 million in this region, leading to a total worldwide figure of some 19 million. Tectoy also continued developing a number of well-implemented region-exclusive titles up until 1998, including a pretty awesome take of Street Fighter 2. and even Earthworm Jim. In 2015, it was reported that the Master System still sold around 150,000 units per year in Brazil, a level that holds its own against modern systems, and this obviously means that current incarnations are still available, with the Master System Evolution sitting as the latest offering. It incorporates 132 games, although with new game development dead on its feet, the last cartridge-based unit was manufactured in 2003. Since 2000, some 2 million Master System based units have been sold in this area. So, that is the Sega Master System. To this day, it also continues in a handheld form, similar to what the Game Gear brought us, and it holds a great deal of nostalgia for those who owned one. Most of us consider it to be Sega's rival to Nintendo's Entertainment System, which it tried so hard to be, but the original rival was actually the SG-1000, and it's really the two year delay between that and the Mark III hardware which allowed Nintendo to make their move and smash the 8-bit scene. However you look at it, the Sega Master System was a technically solid machine, and it allowed Sega to continue their hardware development, paving the way for their most successful and highly regarded machine. When we take a look at the Mega Drive, we'll see how it tipped those Nintendo weighted scales in the opposite direction. Thank you for watching my video on the Sega Master System, a console very close to my heart. There's some other videos below you can watch if you like, you can subscribe to receive future updates, you can give that video a thumbs up or share it, that helps a lot, and you can even contribute to my Patreon channel and there's various rewards you can collect for doing that. But in any case, thank you very much for watching as always, and have a good night.